Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone, all locations. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. I am thrilled about uh, starting this new series. But I just want to first give a shout out, come on, to something that happened last week. We had kind of like a, a big thing happen last week, and that is we opened a new location. Come on, and now we have North Church, Deer Creek. Come on, give it up. Yes. You're going to see a lot of pictures on the screen, and uh, basically these are some of the stuff that happened last week. As we had hundreds of people gather, we have a lot of volunteers, we have a lot of new families, kids there. It's an exciting time. Fifteen years ago, this journey started to launching this new location. Fifteen years ago. What do you mean, Pastor? Because 15 years ago, my wife and I left our position to start a church. Our goal was to open uh, a church in Deer Creek, but the door shut. Nothing happened there. We had to move over uh, to where we presently are kind of in the area we are now and just north and east of here a little bit. And 15 years later, how many know God has his timing, Right. Fifteen years later, we're able to see this happen, and so we celebrate with what God is doing in Deer Creek. Come on, one time. Will you give it up? Come on. Deer Creek, glad to have you. Part of what God is doing in the North Church family. Okay, turn with me in your Bibles, the book of Ruth, chapter number one. We're starting a new series today. This series is called Amazing. Because truly it is an amazing story, and I want to challenge you this week to sit down and read through the book of Ruth, okay? Even if you have other reading plans, it's only going to take you about 20 minutes in one setting to read through, maybe 25 minutes uh, to read through that. But this is a real flesh and blood story of two ladies, okay, we'll introduce another man too uh, next week into this story that's a key figure, who lived the unexpected plan of God. Now, it's a story filled with tragedy, it's a story filled with struggle, but it's also of death, of pain, but it's also a story of romance. It's a story of heaven-inspired hope, and truly it's an amazing story of what God can and will do for people who trust him. This story, get this, this story could be the oldest short story in human history. And it is definitely one of the most beautiful love stories in human history. It is filled with these things that I will dive into in just a moment. It is filled with Free-for-alls, with famine, with failure, with funerals, but most importantly, it's filled with faith. So let's dive into it. Chapter number one and verse number one, look what it says. In the days when the judges ruled, ruled, that's key to note, in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem, Judah, of Judah, in Judah, left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. The first thing to write down in your notes is this, okay? Uh, It's what we noticed that when the judges ruled and a severe famine. So the first thing is free-for-all. In other words, they were living it up. They were sinning left and right. Matter of fact, let me just kind of clarify what is going on here. Think of New Orleans Mardi Gras at its top. And think of Panama Beach college students, spring break, living it up. And what you have is Hebrews have gone wild. (laughs) Come on, that's what's going on here. And specifically, when the judges ruled... What you got to understand is that this story is happening in the context of the book of Judges. You just go to the left, you've got the book of Judges, right? Okay, what was the book of Judges about? The book of Judges was about the free-for-all that the children of Israel were living in. They were not following God's standards, God's ways. Matter of fact, the very last verse of the book of Judges sums it all up. And basically, this is what Ruth and her family are living in. Look at this. This is what it says, okay? It says, in those days, Israel had no, say it with me, king. So what does that mean? There was no person governing, providing leadership. It means it in two contexts. There's a physical side in regards to the government, but there is a spiritual side to this because the children of Israel were wanting to be like the other nations around them. They wanted to have their own king. Instead of God being king, they wanted to have a man as king. That's not what God wants for you. 
Come on, he wants you to make sure that God is king of everything, of your decisions, of your business, of your family, of all of the decisions you make in your life. So that's what's going on. Now look at it. All the people did whatever seemed, say it with me, right in their own eyes. Come on, read that last part. They did what seemed, what? Right in their own eyes. Come on, when you do what is right in your own eyes, it leads to death, dying, bad decisions, remorse, regret. How many know what? How many of you have done things that was right in your own eyes and you look back now and you say, that was stupid, that was dumb, I made a mistake. I regret that. All of us can say that because we've all know. That's why in the book of Proverbs it says there's a way that seems right unto man and the end thereof is what? It's death and destruction. That's, we've got to be careful because we can fall into that trap. Now, I talked about a couple of weeks ago that there is pleasure in sin, right? That's what the Bible says, that there's pleasure in sin for a season. Come on, I, I even talked about that if you aren't, have never enjoyed sinning, then you weren't sinning right. You need to find somebody that can teach you how to sin. Because the, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin. Don't be like, oh, Mrs. Spiritual, like, oh, no, I did not ever enjoy sin. You weren't sinning right, or you're flat out lying. Okay, because there is pleasure in sin. But the word pleasure in sin for seating means fleeting pleasures in sin. In other words, then comes judgment. The fruit of sin, the fruit of living life for yourself is never rewarding. It brings remorse, it brings pain, it brings suffering, it brings regret, it hurts other people. Even when you keep it hidden from other people and no one else knows, there's a cloud of shame and limitation from what God wants in your life that's hovering over you because of the sin. And so they may call it freedom, free for all, freedom, but it's really what? Bondage. That's what it is. Okay? Okay. The second thing you have in here is a famine. So it says a severe famine. Now it's interesting to note, this was, it starts in Bethlehem in Judah. Bethlehem, that word, you can write this down, means a house of bread. A house of prosperity. A house of blessing. A house of goodness. And you look throughout human history and the Bible, and amazing people came through Bethlehem. Great stuff. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was born where? Bethlehem in Judah. And so we have a lot of good things that come from there, but it says that there's a famine. That, that's kind of odd because you've got the people of God in Bethlehem, and there's a famine, a place of bread. That's kind of like saying that there is no food at Whole Foods Market. Okay? That's like saying that there's, it's empty. There's nothing there. No, that doesn't work right. But that's what happens when you live a free-for-all life. It leads to famine. And for the children of Israel, they had lived life for themselves, free-for-all, and it led to what? Say it with me. Famine. That's what happens when we live for ourselves. You see, famine does not always mean that you're living in sin. You hear me in this. Because we go through famines in our life. We go through difficult times in our life that God can take us through. So anytime you go through financial struggle, issues, relational, jobs, whatever, that doesn't mean you're sinning. But I want you to stop always and ask because it also could mean that you're sinning and it could mean that you're out of God's will and it could mean that you're not doing what God wants you to do. And in this case, it means that they were not doing what God would have them to do. And so therefore, there was a famine. Their appetites for sinful desires led to emptiness. Look at verse number two. The man's name was Imelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephronites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they what? Settled there. This is key to note. When they reached Moab, Moab's the key place. They settled there. Moab settled there. What does that mean? What is that about? Moab settled there. Which brings me to the next point. Write this down, failure. Free-for-alls lead to famines, which lead to failures. I, I was thinking back several years ago when I was in middle school. I was just starting middle school. I had some friends over, and I had already been to some friend's house and stayed the night. And so one thing I noticed is that what happened in their home didn't happen in our home. And one thing that happened in our home is that my dad would gather us around, and we would all read the Bible together and pray together. 
And so I always thought that was natural until I went somewhere else. But when I had someone come over, I remember the first time thinking I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed, like, oh, Dad, don't pray tonight. Don't do this tonight. Don't embarrass me. And so my friend was over, and my dad did it, and I was feeling so embarrassed that my dad was praying for, over us and reading the Bible. And, and then I remember going, like, to the bedroom and getting ready for bed that night, and my friend looking over at me says, do you always do that as a family? And I was kind of like, oh, yeah, we do. Embarrassed to say it, admit it, thinking that. And then he says, you're so lucky. I said, what do you mean? He said, I wish my dad would do that. And that was the first time in my life that I realized how fortunate I was. From then on, I wasn't embarrassed. From then on, I was proud that my dad led his family the way my dad led his family. And you know, in this story here, Imelech, the problem starts because he doesn't lead his family in the things of God. Come on, he moves to Moab. Now, moving's not a problem. It's where he moved to and where he settled at. That was the problem. It was Moab. And there's no sign that God said, go there, that he prayed about it. There's no indication. He just did it. Men, let me just say something. You have an incredible responsibility to lead your family. And here's, here's what happens, is that they go to Moab. Now, who was Moab? Who is Moab about people? Let me give you Abraham, who's the father of the Christian faith and also the Jewish faith. We all go back to him. And then there was another character in that story named Lot. Abraham obeyed God. He got up and left. Lot followed him. Lot was an, a friend of, I mean, excuse me, a relative of his. But over time, it, be, it becomes clear that Lot really wanted the things of the world more than the things of God. And even one time when they realize they've got a split, they're standing there, and Abraham said, just pick wherever you want to go. And Lot looks at the fertile plains of Sodom and Gomorrah and says, I want that. Because he wasn't looking through spiritual eyes, he was looking for through natural eyes. And so he chose that land, he goes there, which is filled with sin, filled with evil, filled with all kinds of stuff. Okay, eventually, eventually God rescues him through the prayers of uh, Abraham and then some angels that are sent there because he's about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He pulls him out, okay, with his daughters and on the way out with his wife, uh, the city is destroyed. Well, Lot's wife goes back or looks back, it says, and turns into a pillar of salt. I mean, when, when people look at the Bible and say, oh, it's boring, it's, you're, you're crazy. This book is like awesome. This book is filled with adventure, filled with stories that like, wow, that is amazing. And so she turns into a pillar of salt. And then basically Lot ends up realizing that my daughters don't have their husbands because they stayed back. They've died now. And he goes ahead, has sex with his daughters, impregnates them. And that's how the Moabite race starts. And then now you got the picture of them worshiping Chemosh, which was a god of infidelity and was a god of sacrifice. So they were doing human sacrifices. And God is saying, I don't want you to go hang out with them. They're not worshiping the one true God. They're living a life of just sexual promiscuity. And then they're worshiping this God of, that they're offering idols to. I mean, human sacrifice to. I don't want you to be there. And yet he still goes there and he settles there. Men, I want you to stand up. If you are, let me put it this way. If you're a husband or you're a father, stand up to your feet. Husbands or fathers, stand Now, men, I want you to realize that the decisions you make don't just affect you. They affect your spouse if you're married. They affect your children. They affect everyone that you're responsible for. Matter of fact, let me just say something about this. You are the head of your home. Even if you are divorced or you're going through whatever it is, if you have children, you're ahead of your home. Now, it might not have been given to you. Somebody may not acknowledge it. Our culture might not look at it that way. But the Bible says that you're the head of the home. Now, with you being the head of the home, that doesn't mean you're the bully or you're the boss. Matter of fact, the Bible says that we submit to one another as we submit unto the Lord. But ultimately, you're the one that's going to give an account for everything in your life. And your role is to provide for your family. Now, Imelech thought he was providing for his family when he took them and he left the famine that was going on to go to another land because economically, he said, but economic provision is not the only way you provide for your family. That is a way you provide for your family, but it's not the top way you provide for your family. The top way you provide for your family is not putting bread on the table, but putting spiritual bread in their lap. It's pointing them to Jesus Christ. It's giving them the word of God. And your role is to protect your family. 
Well, what does that mean? We look at protecting our family. I'm like, yes, oh, yeah, I would die for my family. Well, will you serve your family? Will you just simply be there for your family emotionally and mentally and spiritually? Will you lead them into a place of God's house where they can get the bread of life every week and you lead the way saying we're going to go no matter what? We're going to make sure we schedule our time so that we can find a way to be in God's house and worship together and to protect your family that way? I want to pray over you. Father, I just pray for these men. And God, I just ask that your Holy Spirit will lead them and direct them, that they will submit themselves completely to you. And they'll provide. God, they'll provide not just of the physical things, but of the spiritual things. They'll protect their family, not just in a physical way, but first and foremost in a spiritual way. And I pray this in your name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now I want all the other men to stand up, okay? If you didn't stand up on that call, the rest of you stand up. The rest of the men stand up. Twelve years, everybody's looking around like, am I a man or not? <laughs> Lord, set back down if you have to look and figure out if you're a man or not. Okay? Stand up, stand up. I mean, if you're 12 years of age and up, I got young people standing up that are teenagers like, you are a man. In our culture, let me say something to teenagers for just a moment. In our culture, we have labeled you as teenagers, you're not a man yet. Yes, you are a man. The question is, are you going to act like a man or not? Hear me? Are you going to act like a man or not? Because in our culture, we said teenagers aren't men yet. No, no, no. You look back and through, there was little kids and there was men. And at some point, you've got to stand, choose to be a man. In, in our culture today, why don't you hear me on this? When it comes to single women versus single men, okay, single men versus single women, single women now, there's more in the workforce than there are single men. There are more that are in college and getting college degrees than men. There are more that have driver's license than men, okay? And I'm not, I'm celebrating that. That is awesome. I'm glad to see the women coming up. But men, a lot of that's been because of your own laziness, that you have not resumed your responsibility. Men are waiting till they longer in life to get married. They're waiting till like 30 years of age to get married. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. The problem is what they are doing all the way up to 30 years of age, because most of them are sleeping around, they're not getting jobs, they're not moving forward in life, and all of a sudden they're just like, oh, they're just living life and having fun. That's not what God intended for you to do. And getting married won't turn boys into men. You know what getting married will do? It will give boys a man-sized responsibility they can't handle yet. I want to see you step up and say, you know what? I am becoming the man God wants me to become. I'm giving myself to the word of God, and I'm preparing myself for the great adventure God has for me. I want to pray over you. Father, I pray for these men that are standing. God, I pray your Holy Spirit upon them. God, that they choose to sink their roots down in you, and they grow. They're not waiting to become this man someday. But, God, they're choosing to push away from the Game Boy, push away from the videos, push away from the stuff. And they're saying, I'm going to get out get a job. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to dive into God's word. I'm going to come to the house of God. I'm going to sink my roots in the spiritual things so that I can prepare myself to be a man that can lead other people in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> verse number three. Look at verse number three. Verse number three says, Then Imelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other married a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her what? Husband. I want you to write this down. The next one is funerals. So we got free for all, which led to famine, which led to failures, which leads to always Funerals. Funerals. When I was nine years of age, I had a, this favorite dog of mine uh, named Blue. Nine years of age. And I'd had him since the time I was four years of age. Uh, maybe three years of age. But I had him for several years. Great dog. The best dog in the world. And he was hit by a vehicle on the farm. Died. I didn't know about it. Later that night, my dad told me. And I remember crying and just thinking, like, oh, no, Blue's dead. And I asked what he did with him, and Dad said he went and buried Blue out in the pasture. I said, where? And he told me where. And I remember feeling that overwhelming grief. And <clears throat> so guess what I did? Being the young boy that was a Sunday school uh, regular at church and, like, Sunday night, Monday, Wednesday night, and uh, 
So like Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all these services I'd go to, I'd heard these stories of faith and how that God raised up the dead. So for the next four days, I went out to the grave of Blue, and I prayed over that grave that God would resurrect my dog. I, don't laugh. This is serious. I was like hurting. And I was like, I prayed, I prayed, I just prayed. And my theology was shaken because he didn't come out of the grave. And I was like, God, please, raise up. Well, eventually over time, I moved on. And I say that because of this. There's a lot of death and dying in people's lives. And at some point, you've got to move on and realize that that wasn't the way. You, when they moved to Moab, get this. Why did they move to Moab? To avoid the famine so that they would not what? Say it with me. Die. That's why they moved to Moab. But what did they end up doing in Moab? They died. Imelech died. Molan died. Kilion died. And how, how about the death of children, the future, and, the, and the, the, their, their family re and moving forward? They had no children. Ten years being married and no children. It speaks to the wombs that were empty also and the death that was there. It was speaking to God's not blessing, their decision. Now, I'm not saying if you're barren in your womb that it's because of sin and all this stuff. That's not the case. That's not, it, but in this specific case, it is very clear in Scripture that God had chosen not to bless them because they were outside God's will and God's plan for their life. And when that happens, sometimes you just got to pronounce things as they are, that that was wrong, that was death, it was dying, it was out of God's plans, and you got to move on in life. Now, look at Imelech. His name means this, God is king. He was the head of the family. God is king. It's a great Hebrew name, isn't it? God is king. Hebrew name. Awesome. Incredible. You know what he represents? He represents a lot of Christians today that by name, come on, they got it down. By name, they wear the t-shirt that says Jesus is king. They ride around in the cars that has a big fish on the back of it. They look who I'm on. I'm a follower of Jesus. I am a Christian. Wow. Whoopee dee dee. Because you know, bottom line, it really doesn't matter if you're not living in the cubicle during the week. It really doesn't matter what you put on your car, what you wear on your shirt, if you're not living it when you drive down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How are you responding when somebody does you wrong? How are you responding when somebody mistreats you? Are we going to really be Christians or are we going to talk like we're Christians? Is anybody listening to me today? I hope so because I'm trying my best. He had two sons, Malon and Kilion. You know what their names mean? Malon means weak. You know what Kilion means? Dying. Come on, think about those names for kids. Think about going to the supermarket and you meet somebody and they say, oh, what's the name of your kids? Oh, this is my first son. His name's Weak. Here's my second son. His name's Dying. Weak and Dying. They'd be good friends for your kids. That's sad, isn't it? Come on, may North Church not produce Weak and Dying in the next generation. May we produce strong men and women of God who are walking forth in power and might and saying, you know what? We believe God's word. We have the power of his Holy Spirit. We're going to follow his plan, his way. We're not going to choose to live with the Moabites. We're going to choose to be with the people of God, believing God can take care of us. Yeah. You see, Jesus said, if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. Jesus said, if you want to lose your life, then you're going to save it. He said, unless a grain of wheat, this is Jesus again, is planted in the ground and dies first, it cannot produce life. And there's some things that must die. And in this case, they had to move on. Naomi and Ruth had to move on. What is it that you need to move on from? What is it you need to stop and say, it's dead, no more. I'm not gonna give up. Now, I'm gonna move forward and trust Jesus. Is anyone listening? He chose to move forward. You see, there must be necessary endings if there's going to be new beginnings. You might want to write that down. Necessary endings are essential for new beginnings. Which brings me to the last point. Faith. Faith. My son Gavin, this is Super Bowl weekend, so I want to have a Super Bowl football story here, okay? Super Bowl weekend, by the way, go Patriots. Go Patriots. Some of you think, oh, you're just a Tom Brady fan. No, no, no. I was a Patriots fan when they were horrible. <laughs> I became a Patriots fan because one of my friends that grew up in my hometown started playing for them in 1979, Rod Schott, in my little town they grew up in, and I was real close to their family and knew the family well. I became a fan of his and became a fan of the Patriots, so I've been a Patriots fan forever. And so if you want to join the winning team, choose to switch over from whatever team you're in. Dallas Cowboy fans, are you listening? 
If you really want to win Super Bowls, go to the Patriots and then Pittsburgh Steelers fans, are you listening? Come on, have fun with me. Man, I've lost you now. Like, I'm not going to listen to you anymore, he says. <laughs> so my son is going to, in middle school and he decides to play football. I never pushed him that way. I really, football was not something I really wanted him to do, even though I played and kind of enjoyed the game, but he chose to do football. I'm gone on a trip and he needs to get his uniform, okay, his helmet, shoulder pads, pads, all the stuff. And so my wife has to take him, which was kind of like humbling for me. I didn't want my wife to have to take to get my son his first uniform. You know what, how many men know what I'm talking about? I, I wanted to buy that. But she had to do it. And I'm sitting at the office. I come by, I get back in town. I'm sitting at the office. And Gavin and Sh Shannon shows up. Gavin gets out of the car. He's like wearing his helmet and shoulder pads and everything. For the next like three days, he like wears his helmet and shoulder pads everywhere he goes. We're going to the supermarket. He's wearing his helmet and shoulder pads. Son, could you please take off your helmet? You're embarrassing us. Okay? Everywhere he went. And we're laying in bed one night, Shannon and I, and <clears throat> she looks over at me. She says, Rodney, Gavin loves football, doesn't he? I looked at her and said, are you serious? She said, yeah, he wears that uniform everywhere he goes. I said, Shannon, and this only comes from somebody who played football, okay? I said, he loves the idea of football. He loves to dress up like he is a football player. We will find out how much he likes football when somebody twice his size runs over him and knocks him on his rear end We'll find out how much he likes football. And he did get read over, and he got back up, and he loved football. But let me just say this. There's a lot of people of, quote, faith, and I say, quote, faith, that know how to put on the helmet, know how to put on the shoulder pads, know how to put on the gear. They walk around like they're people of faith. But the truth of the matter is when they get themselves ran over by circumstances of life that are twice their size and they get knocked on their butt, then we find out if they're really people of faith or not. You see, I want to see in this church people of faith, not just to put on the helmet, not just put on the shoulder pads, not walk around looking like and talking like that they can play a good game, but they've never been in a fight. I want to have people that are full of faith that when you get knocked on your butt, when you lose your job, when you get cancer announced to your home, when you lose something that's precious in your life, but yet you still will stand up and say, my God is in control and my God has never failed me and he won't ever fail me and I'm going to move forward in Jesus' name. People of faith. Let me give you some things about faith. First off is this. Faith believes there is a better way. Get, faith begins because it believes there's a better way. There's a better way than the free-for-alls. There's a better way than the famines. There's a better way than the funerals. There's a better way than the failures. There's a better way than my marriage right now. There's a better way than raising my kids right now the way we're raising. There's a better way than focusing on that stuff. There's a better way than just getting more money and more stuff that is not fulfilling, that leaves me empty, that there has to be a better way. That is a person of faith. Notice what it says in verse number six. It says, then Naomi heard in Moab that the people had blessed his, the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. Faith believes there is a better way. Secondly is this, faith begins even when you see no way. Did you get that? Faith has to start somewhere, and it begins even when you, what? Let that sink in. Look at verse number 7. Look at verse number 7. It says, with her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living. This is key to note. You can never move on to the agenda that God has for you staying where you presently are. You can complain about where you are. You can talk about where you are. You can believe for all you got. But at some point, you've got to begin the journey. Are people listening today? 
At some point, you've got to take steps in that direction that's going to heal the marriage, that's going to restore the relationship, that's going to get you to the better job, that's going to move you forward. Staying there talking and complaining about it is never going to get it done. And some people will sit and talk about it and feel like they got all the answers, but they're not even listening and seeking out the right authorities and people in their life that can help them move on with Jesus. Look at the rest of this. And they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. What road are you taking? Because that's key. There's a lot of roads. Culture says there's a road. Education says there's a road. I mean, there's a lot of people saying this is the best road. You know what? The road that you're going to take, that God wants you to take, is probably going to be the road that's less traveled. The road that God sends you on is going to be oftentimes the narrow road. Come on, that people are like, that's not the way you do it. No, no, it is the way you do it. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Come on, and you got to follow after Jesus and what he has for you. And that's not going to be inviting sometimes. It may be tough sometimes. The road that you have to take might be the road that is the most challenging, but in the end will be the road that's most rewarding. Next one is this. Not only faith believes there is a better way, faith begins even when there is no way, but faith behaves in a way that refuses to quit. Refuses to quit. Amalek quit when he chose to say, let's just go to Moab. He gave up on the famine. God didn't move him. He moved himself. How do I know that? But Because you find out later in the story that we'll get into that God was blessing people that stayed in the middle of the famine. Because God can take care of you. God can keep you. You can go through hell. You can go through famines. You can go through funerals. But my God is more than able to take care of you. If you'll by faith, depend on him and let him. And so here they are. And so the kids are gone. The husband's gone. Naomi has the two daughter-in-laws. And she starts the journey. She stops and says, no, no, why are you going with me? I have nothing to offer you. There's no insurance money. There's no retirement here. I'm, I'm not getting married again. If I get married and have children, what are you going to wait, 20 years for me to give birth and raise a child? And It ain't going to happen, girls. Go back. I have nothing for you. And Orpah immediately says, I'm going back. Her name means gazelle, fleeing, running. You know what happens a lot of times with hard times? When really the path that God has laid out, it's easy to flee, isn't it? It's easy to run. It's easy to just go. It's hard to stay. Sometimes the greatest faith is just staying in the marriage, just staying in that relationship, staying at that job, staying there where God has you and choosing the road that God wants for you and making the most of it. But Ruth, Ruth decided otherwise. Listen to what she said. This is powerful. You talk about behaves in a way that refuses to quit. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you live, I will live. Your people be my people, and your God my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I'll be buried. May the Lord punish me. Be severely, if, any, if I allow anything but death to separate us. Exclamation point. When Naomi heard or saw that Ruth was determined, determined, look at the person next to you and say, are you determined? To go with her, she said nothing more. Who is the person of faith in this story? It should have been one of the Israelites. It should have been one of the Hebrews. It should have been Imelech. It should have been maybe his two sons. It should have been Naomi. But who was it? It was the Moabite that God rose up. Do you realize there's two books in the Bible with women names to them? Esther, Ruth. Ruth is by one that is a Moabite. And God's a testimony to the world it's a testimony to us today of what God can do. Even when your heritage and your family line has been all jacked up, God can still raise up a man or woman of God of faith. Naomi, look at her name. Her name was Pleasant. That's what her name means. But you know what she did? She goes down to the DMV. She changes her, changes her name. She says, I put my, put my new name on my license right now. Is, my name is now Mara. Used to be pleasant, now it's bitter. Bitter. Are you allowing the circumstances of life to make you bitter? Come on, I hope, I hope that you don't allow the free-for-alls that have happened by other people 
the famines, the funerals, the failures that have happened to make you bitter. Come on, I believe that I want to grow older and I want to get better. I want to get sweeter. I want to get more kinder. I want to get more of a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. I don't want to allow funerals and failures and famines in my life to make me bitter. I want them to make me more better, to show the hand of God and to trust in God that no matter what happens in my life, God is going to get me through. Look at Matthew chapter number one. Ruth, it says Sal- Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was what? No, 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 here's the thing. Now we went to the New Testament. The New Testament, and why is that there? What, what does that mean? That doesn't mean a lot to me, does it to you? Until you dive into it. Because this is the genealogy of a very important man. You know who that man is? Jesus. You know some other important people? King David. Ruth was the grandma of King David. And the great, 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 great grandmother of King Jesus. And all these men are listed listed in that chronological account. But it throws in these two women. Who are these two women? There's also a couple of other women in there too. Come on, you get, find out their story. Tamar, go, go read her story. But Rahab was a prostitute. God says, I want you to know she's in there. And then Ruth, the Moabite. I want you to know she's in there. Because it speaks to what God can do. But people of faith will trust him. Jesus came out of this woman of faith who said, I refuse to give up. I refuse to fight the good fight of faith. And I think about what Jesus said once. He said, remember Lot's wife. uh, wife. Remember Lot's wife? I gave you a little brief history of that early on. But today I want you to remember Lot's great, great, great grandmother. Granddaughter, excuse me. Granddaughter, Ruth. I want you to remember her because she speaks to us today. Amen? Amen. I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And I want you to know, you're here in this place right now, and you're not a follower of Jesus. God is calling you right out through his power and his Holy Spirit to follow after Jesus. To give your life completely to him. And for many others, it's about sinking your roots down. It's about becoming a person of faith. Stop playing games. Stop just dressing up like you're spiritual, but truly saying, I'm going to be a person of faith that's not going to allow anything to shake me. Because it's going to be grounded on the one and only Jesus Christ. Father, I pray in this room right now, as individuals are coming to know you as Lord and Savior, they're choosing to follow you, choosing to repent of their sins, choosing to make you Lord of their life. And God, then there's many others that just simply are saying, I want to be a Ruth. Raise up men. Raise up women. Spiritual giants in Jesus' name. Amen.